So I would like to thank everyone uh, to joining us and I'm very grateful to Professor Andre Nussenzweig for accepting our seminar invitation. So he's a true leader of the energy tech field and many seminal discoveries in the field come from his lab. Uh, I would also like to kindly ask everyone if they could mute their microphones. Please do mute your microphones. Thank you very much. So Professor Andre Nussenzweig, he studied physics at Yale, and then he did a postdoc in physics in Paris. And it is only when he came back to US uh, to Sloan Kettering to work in Department of Medical Physics that he started combining physics with biology. This was a great opportunity to transition to a new field in biology. So in 1988, he became NCI uh, National Cancer Institute independent investigator and he studied Q70, Q80 proteins. In 2011, he became chief and established a new department in NCI, which is called Laboratory of Genomic Integrity. So his seminal contributions in DNA repair are recognized by many, many awards and many memberships. So I'll only mention a few, which is membership of European Molecular Biology Organization, NIH Distinguished Investigator, and he's also a member of US National Academy of Medicine. So um, I would also like to highlight um, two of the famous discovery, which is the, the histone variant H2AX acts as a tumor suppressor. And the reason I picked this as a highlight, because I think it was a key finding that established a link between chromatin and DNA repair and genomic stability. And another truly remarkable finding was this was his work on the antagonizing role between BRCA and 53BP1. So the fact that removal of 53BP1 can suppress BRCA phenotype. So this obviously guided a lot of cancer therapy uh, today. So his lab is also pushing and developing a lot of exciting technologies such as NSEQ, which can map DNS double strand breaks with astonishing precision and sensitivity. Um, so these are just a few highlights. Um, so uh, I'm gonna stop now because I'm very excited and impatient to hear new discoveries from Professor Andre Nussenzweig uh, laboratory. So thank you, Professor Nussenzweig. Thanks so much, Ivana, for the uh, kind introduction and uh, for Ivana and Simon for inviting me. Um, I hope that you, can you hear me well and um, hopefully see my slides? Just let me know, Ivana, maybe just tell me that. Yes, um, it looks perfect. It looks good? Okay, great. So as Ivana mentioned, my lab is interested and in, has been studying for many years, the uh, cellular response to uh, DNA damage, which both from endogenous and exogenous uh, sources. Um, and this DNA damage can take a multitude of different uh, flavors. You can get damage to um, both strands, generating a double strand break uh, to a, a single strand, um, damage to um, various bases, um, loss of bases, mismatches. So there's a multitude of different lesions and also a multitude of different repair pathways that um, uh, deal with um, these various lesions. And obviously DNA repair is not perfect. Um, and occasionally you can get um, mutations um, as, uh, um, because of these uh, different types of damages. And this, is, this chart just gives the estimated frequency. I don't know if it's correct, but it's an estimated frequency of endogenous DNA uh, damage per cell per, per day. Um, so it's very clear that mutations cause cancer and they also increase the uh, risk of cancer. Uh, uh, during aging. I think what's less clear and what we've become more interested lately is um, how DNA damage and or if DNA damage and mutation can lead to tissue uh, dysfunction and the pathologies associated with aging. Now this uh, topic is not new. Um, I think this is one of the first papers 40 years ago um, suggesting um, that DNA damage is the primary cause of uh, aging. So, um, and um, just want to highlight a few things. They, in this paper, uh, the authors uh, you know, mentioned that 
that the somatic line is vulnerable to DNA damage and hence can undergo aging. Um, and pointed out there's several types of endogenous DNA damage, but, but it wasn't clear what are the lesions that might be important for um, uh, or critical for aging. And they also pointed out that the deterioration of the central nervous system appears critical for the aging process. And, and they hypothesized that maybe this is because of low DNA repair capacity um, uh, in the post-mitotic brain tissue. I found it very interesting that 40 years later uh, in the last issue of Nature, the same hypothesis is really uh, proposed, and that, namely that there's a central role of DNA damage uh, in the aging process. But once again, they pointed out some difficulties. They say that the serious challenge for linking DNA legions to aging has remained the methodological difficulty of accurately measuring uh, genome-wide variation uh, in, in DNA, namely DNA damage. And so we're, we can measure somatic mutations very, very well, and the somatic mutations increase during aging in multiple tissues. Um, but they say that the quantitative estimates of the total landscape of spontaneous DNA damage in humans and animals are lacking. So this is the task, um, you know, this is what I wanted to discuss with you today, the, um, our recent study about spontaneous uh, DNA damage in the brain. This is the problem that we tackled. And it was a complicated problem not only because of the technical difficulties that have been around for 40 years, but also I think the extent of DNA damage in this tissue, at least what would one, one would predict. You know, the brain consumes probably more oxygen than other tissues because of its high activity. Um, and oxygen leads to free radicals that can dam damage cellular constituents, including uh, the DNA. Um, and again, this type of damage could be many different forms, um, and you would predict that the DNA damage would be widespread throughout the gene, uh, uh, throughout the whole genome. And I think the um, take home message today that I'd like to tell you is that indeed we found that there's widespread DNA damage in neurons, but um, strikingly this DNA damage was localized to specific regions of the genome. And that was a um, very, very surprising uh, result for us. Um, so neurons um, are, are special be and, and different from some other cell types because number one, uh, they don't proliferate. And number two, they don't reje rejuvenate um, them, themselves. So they're hanging around throughout the life of an individual and they are susceptible, we think, to all of this oxidative, presumably oxidative uh, DNA damage. And that um, you know, has been hypothesized for, for more than 40 years to lead to um, um, tissue degeneration, neur neuron degeneration um, and, and neurodegeneration. And one of the mechanisms by which this can occur is indeed if the DNA repair pathways are not faithful and you get uh, somatic um, uh, mutations. And um, as I mentioned, somatic mutations are measured very well. Uh, in a recent paper, it was estimated um, that with current technologies, you get about 15 errors um, by whole genome sequencing per uh, genome, which, might, which is probably lower than the somatic mutation uh, load. And um, uh, several studies really pioneered by Chris Walsh's group at Harvard um, utilized um, whole genome sequence of single neurons in, from post-mortem brain um, to study mutations, these somatic mutations as a function of uh, age. And they had uh, very interesting findings. Number one, they found that when you're born, neurons from newborns ha carry about 500 to 900 already somatic uh, mutations. And these increase uh, with age at a rate of about 20 to 40 somatic mutations uh, per cell per year. And what was very interesting is that the mutations didn't appear to be random, but they seemed to be targeted mainly to open chromatin 
um, a lot of promoters and enhancers, and this is where the mutations were really uh, dominant. And this was interesting because it was distinct from cancer genomes, where the majority of mutations are actually in closed, um, inaccessible uh, chromatin. And they utilize these, these mutations to determine, just like they do in cancer, for, they look for uh, mutational signatures that might reflect the DNA damage that was occurring uh, in these neurons. Um, and what they found is predominantly two signatures that increased with age. And one of, this, one of them is the cytosine uh, deamination signature, basically a C to T, frequent, a frequent C to T uh, mutations, possibly because of spontaneous uh, deamination. But also they found this oxidative uh, DNA damage uh, signature. So, you know, in conclusion, they said that um, there is age re related mutational signatures of both deamination and oxidative stress, um, possibly because of misrepair, likely because of misrepair of these types of uh, damages. So, in this talk, I'm not really going to be speaking about mutations, but rather the source, the potential source of the mutations, namely DNA damage. And we're going to address a couple of questions. Number one, what form of endogenous DNA damage actually accumulates in post-mitotic uh, neurons? Um, can we address this question? What is the source of this damage and the mechanisms of repair? And do the lesions accumulate throughout the neural genome or at specific loci? I already told you the answer that uh, strangely they accumulate at specific loci. Um, and then I'm going to speculate about how these lesions uh, in neurons are linked to are actually linked to mutation and neurodegeneration. So to do this study, we really needed a, a robust source of neurons. Uh, and for this, we collaborated with a terrific investigator here at NIH, Michael Ward, who is a neurobiologist. Um, and he has a system in which he uses um, IPS, IPS cells derived from a donor, and he induces the differentiation with a single transcription factor um, named um, uh, neurogenin 2. So this is inducible by doxycycline, and then upon transcription factor activity, the, these IPSCs rapidly differentiate into uh, neurons. Already by day seven, they already have these axons, and they're fully differentiated by um, day 28. And the, these are excitatory um, uh, neurons that are produced by um, uh, neurogenin 2. It's pretty magical how a single transcription factor um, can, you know, transform iPSCs into uh, um, the neurons. And, you know, the, the one thing that this so-called pioneer transcription factor does, it, it actually um, somehow gets uh, recruited to normally inactive enhancers in the iPSCs. And through a series of steps um, involving chromatin remodeling, loss of DNA methylation, which silences enhancers, and removal of repressive marks, you kind of magically get uh, neuron-specific gene expression, and then the cells are transformed into uh, neurons. Very fascinating. Um, but, you know, now that we have these neurons that Michael Ward generated, we, the, our goal was to measure uh, DNA repair and DNA damage. But, you know, how do we measure it if we don't even know what type of DNA damage uh, is present? So that, that's the conundrum. Um, but we took a um, basically the playbook from how people were measuring DNA repair in the 1970s. Because, you know, one common thing about all different DNA repair pathways is that they excise the lesion, the, the, the strand containing uh, the lesion, they get rid of it, um, and then they synthesize the DNA off of the undamaged uh, uh, template. This is common in most DNA repair pathways. So what they were doing in the 70s is adding a tritiated thymidine to incorporate um, in this, uh, during this DNA synthesis, after which there's ligation. And you can see that after UV irradiation, you get spots from an audio radiographic assay. And these spots 
represent the sites of DNA synthesis, which is presumably the sites of DNA repair. You know, Michael Ward pointed out to me that the first author, uh, Joshua Sains, is actually a neurobiologist. I didn't know that. So he was doing his PhD at Harvard in, in, in 1972. Um, and he did some experiments in, in neurons. In, in addition to UV irradiation, he mentioned that the neurons were never densely labeled with tritiated thymidine under any of conditions examined, and 98% of them were completely unlabeled in the control culture. And he said that this confirms a previous report that neurons do not normally incorporate tritiated thymidine in culture. So if I had read that before, which I didn't, uh, I wouldn't have done the uh, designed the following experiment, which basically modernizes uh, this same uh, assay looking for DNA repair um, um, in neurons. So we, we called it a different name, synthesis associated re repair. It used to be called unscheduled uh, 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 DNA synthesis. Um, um, and so we generated uh, neurons from iPSCs with Michael Ward and figuring that now we're looking at endogenous uh, DNA damage. And we, and we use, instead of tritidated thymidine, we used the thymidine analog EDU to label the DNA damage if it was, if you had this DNA synthesis. And then we use a clicket reaction to attach biotin to the EDU. And then we could subsequently, after sonication, pull down um, the biotinylated EDU and then perform next generation uh, sequencing. And to determine whether there are specific sites of EDU incorporation. Um, and specific sites of EDU incorporation would look like the peaks of DNA synthesis. Um, and unlike um, what Joshua um, Sands found um, in the 70s, we, using this method, probably more sensitive than tritidated thymidine, we found that in, um, in these um, iPSC-derived neurons, there were distinct peaks of DNA uh, synthesis. And you can see this in this um, large region, um, this snapshot um, of greater than 200 KB. And you do the experiment a couple of times, and you can see that the data is remarkably uh, reproducible. The peaks uh, are maintained. And um, um, it, it was very gratifying that in a um, Rusty Gages group, a neurobiologist um, at the Salk Institute, um, found very, very similar results in a different uh, system of uh, differentiation to uh, neurons. And these peaks uh, occupied just a small fraction of the genome. Only about 2% of the genome um, was associated with these peaks of synthesis. So they're very, very um, um, uh, specific. Um, and I want to make a point here that they're recurrent, right? So if DNA repair synthesis was all over the genome, if it was random, um, it would be present, but there would, we would see no peaks. It would look like noise to us. And of course, if there was no DNA synthesis, we wouldn't see anything either. So, um, you know, the brain and neurons are, you know, are not only, it's not the only tissue that consumes a lot of oxygen. If you just look at oxygen consumption, it's pretty prominent in the heart and muscle, though or those are the two top oxygen consuming uh, tissues. Um, and the great thing is that we can differentiate iPSCs to different uh, cell types. So when we differentiate iPSC to skeletal muscle, um, using a very similar setup, but different transcription factors, we can then perform our so-called SAR-seq in um, skeletal muscle. And we're really surprised that in contrast to neurons, and this is the entire chromosome seven, where you see very, very distinct uh, peaks all over chromosome seven in the neurons, we see absolutely no synthesis um, um, in muscle. Okay, so instead of muscle, we then looked at cardiomyocytes because we could differentiate the, the iPSCs to cardiomyocytes. And again, uh, there was nothing. There was no DNA synthesis in the cardiomyocytes, um, but we have very prominent peaks in um, these um, induced uh, neurons. And so the synthesis associated repair is specific to uh, these um, induced neurons. And then we wondered, okay, is this something about differentiation? What if we, what if we just take you know, real primary neurons from rat? And so we generated uh, uh, rat cortical 
uh, neurons, performed our SAR-seq experiment, and aha, now we see peaks again uh, in, in the neurons. And this is just a zoom in view uh, that you have, again, very, very distinct uh, peaks of DNA synthesis. So it seems that this recurrent DNA repair synthesis, as far as we can tell, is interesting in that it's neuron specific. Uh, I, I would have never guessed that. Um, and so that raises a lot of uh, questions. Why is it neuron specific? You know, what is going on? What is the type of DNA damage? And to start addressing this question, we were, wanted to look, you know, where are these, where, where are this 2% of peaks? Where are they located in, in the genome? And we hypothesized based on the mutational spectrum that I mentioned that open, there was something about open chromatin, which was susceptible to mutation. We figured that maybe these peaks are in open chromatin. So we performed ATAC-seq to look at accessible chromatin um, in the neurons. And you can see that although there's not a perfect co-localization, most of these peaks of SAR-seq are within open chromatin. And we found an even better correlation or, um, with marks of, uh, of enhancers. So enhancers are marked by H3K4 monomethylation and H3K27 acetylation. Um, and, um, and you can see that there's a really a strong overlap between um, uh, these two marks of, of enhancers. And the, um, methyl, the major monomethylase uh, methylase, um, that lays down H3K4 um, um, monomethylation is MLL4. And you can see that MLL4 also localizes to these sites of DNA uh, synthesis. So if we zoom in, we can see precisely where the SAR-seq peaks are relative to the nucleosomes. And you can see that these peaks and the ATEX peaks are really between um, these modified um, enhancer nuclear uh, uh, histones. They're right in the center. So what I'm saying is that the SAR-seq peaks are within these accessible uh, enhancer uh, and then we, you know, we thought that, okay, if they're in the accessible enhancer, maybe there's a transcription factor motif that's prominent with, uh, within these SARC peaks. Um, and so we did a motif analysis um, for, um, associated with our SARC peaks. And indeed, we found a very, very strong uh, motif uh, shown here. And, and this was, um, and then we found that this was associated with a transcription uh, factor family called the one cut family. And this is showing the motif for the one cut one um, transcription factor. And it was present in about a quarter of our SARC peaks. And moreover, um, this motif was present within the center of our SARC peak. So right in the center of part, our, our, our SARC peak, there is a very, very strong transcription factor uh, motif. The only problem was, at least for me, was I never heard of one cut, uh, one cut one. I had never heard of it, but you go to PubMed and immediately found an interesting paper um, uh, suggesting that this transcription factor of the family of the one cut induces um, um, characteristics and remodeling of chromatin accessibility. So it may be involved in chromatin accessibility. And that raised the question of whether accessibility is re actually required for synthesis-associated repair. And we tackled this question by, ba by basically converting the open chromatin to closed chromatin. And we used a trick um, um, use, utilizing CRISPR, CRISPR interference, which you know, you're know you probably familiar that CRISPR, CRISPR interference can um, repress promoters, but it also you can also target it to enhancers to repress uh, the enhancers. And um, so in this method, you have the dead Cas9 fused to this repressive crab domain, and then you just target, target it to uh, enhancers. And what that does is it decreases chromo chromatin accessibility, and you get actually now marks of more heterochromatin-like uh, marks. So this is precisely what we did. We did CRISPR interference in our neurons and targeted them to the SAR sites um, that were associated with um, 
uh, enhancer peaks. And you can see that when you target this particular enhancer, you lose SARC peaks. Did the same thing with another enhancer um, um, associated with SAR, and, you, and, the, and the peaks are gone. So this means that accessibility is actually necessary for the phenomenon that we've observed that's neuron specific. Um, but the question is whether it is sufficient. Um, and here we found that, we actually found that it was not sufficient because when we looked at promoters, not enhancers, but we looked at promoters, which are also uh, accessible, uh, we found that there's not an enrichment of, the, of, of SAR seq at promoters. You can see that them at some promoters, but it's certainly not enriched over uh, random. And, and, and this is very clear when you look at heat maps. When you do a chip for uh, Paul 2 which is localized to promoters, and you looked at the SAR seq peaks, you, you don't see much SAR seq peaks. But on, in contrast, um, these enhancers were, per, you know, not only localized, but they were correlated with the stronger, the SAR seq peak that was associated with the stronger um, uh, enhancer marks. And these weren't just any enhancers. Um, when we examined enhancers that were uh, from the iPSCs from which the neurons were derived, we do not see any enrichment of SARC peaks. It's only the neuron-specific enhancers that show the, um, this uh, DNA, this special DNA uh, synthesis. So it has something to do with the, the cell type. Um, and then we, we know that super enhancers control the cell type or cell identity. Um, and when we examined super enhancers in the neurons, we found about 1,400 super enhancers, and 90% of these super enhancers uh, showed the uh, star seq peaks. So it seems that this endogenous and neuronal specific DNA synthesis, whatever it is, it's localized to enhancers uh, and uh, super enhancers. So that's where it is. Um, but we went back to the question. Is it really DNA damage that's the source of this uh, DNA uh, synthesis? And the, the, the way that we did this is to look at the first responder to DNA damage. Um, it's sort of a universal responder to DNA, DNA damage is the recruitment of the uh, poly-IDP ribose polymerase, uh, PARP, which responds to all different types of lesions and is involved in um, most of the, uh, or all of the uh, DNA repair uh, pathways. So we have a reagent um, that we can look at uh, parlation. And so we just take these neurons and stain for um, ADP ri uh, ribosylation, PAR, um, and you can see immediately in these undamaged neurons, there are specific foci for uh, PAR, um, which we think represent sites of DNA damage. When we treat the cells with um, MMS, um, al alkylating agent that produces multiple lesions and single strand breaks predominantly, you can see that there's widespread um, uh, correlation. So, you know, that raises the question of whether there are preferred sites of DNA repair uh, which, we, which, we, which we measured by the SAR, or there are actually preferred sites of DNA damage. So I illustrate that here. So it could be that there's DNA damage everywhere in theory, but there are preferred sites of DNA repair. Um, uh, or, or, or it could be um, that there, the damage is actually localized to these special sites and the repair happens at these, uh, at these sites at this, as well. And so to, to, you know, to try to tackle this problem, we produce damage everywhere by MMS, as I, as I mentioned before. So here you'd have damage everywhere, including at these special sites. And when we um, did our assay, we noticed that you actually get more EDU inc incorporation upon MMS treatment. So there's more DNA synthesis, okay? And so the question is, does this increase or decrease the site-specific SAR? You could imagine that it could increase the uh, 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 SAR if, even if there's damage everywhere, if there's repair at preferred sites, you'd get increase in SAR signal. However, if, if there is um, 
uh, uh, you know, you, you could also imagine that you would decrease the signal because it would just be, um, you know, it would basically look like random damage everywhere. There'd be repair everywhere and it's, and it's just noise. And this is exactly what we found. When we treat the cells with MMS, we com this completely wipes out the specific uh, signal because it's washed out by the damage that's everywhere. So we conclude that the enhancers, and I'm gonna show you more evidence for this, are associated with preferred sites of DNA damage. It's not like there's damage everywhere and it's ignored and there's special sites of repair. So the first you know, clue of this is that the sites of correlation were distinct. There was distinct foci indicating that maybe these are special uh, sites of DNA damage. And so we actually developed a chip assay with our PAR, anti-PAR reagent. And you can see that although the signal is noisy, there is a you know, strong co-localization uh, co between the PAR signal and the SARC uh, uh, peaks. So both the SAR and the PAR are focused on uh, the enhancers. Um, but that doesn't, since parlation responds to all different types of lesions, um, it doesn't really tell you what type of DNA damage. As I showed you in the first slide, there's many types of uh, DNA damage, um, oxidative DNA damage, single-strand breaks, double-stranded breaks, abasic sites, and um, you know, cytosine uh, de deamination is very frequently. Um, and any of these lesions um, could attract the uh, PARP enzyme, um, and it could lead to synthesis-associated repair, and also, of course, mutation. So we know pretty well how to measure double-strand breaks using the uh, gamma H2AX antibody. And in non-treated neurons, we didn't see any evidence of uh, gamma H2AX induction. Of course, you can induce um, gamma H2AX with a treatment with a toposide. Um, but in untreated neurons, we didn't see any uh, gamma H2AX. We also performed our assay uh, um, um, that Ivana uh, mentioned, NSEQ, which maps uh, double strand breaks. And we found no evidence of double strand breaks associated with these SAR sites. I'll be speaking a little bit about that NSEQ assay in a, in a moment. But whatever we did, we could not see double strand breaks um, in these cells. So then we, uh, we wanted to see whether there could be single strand breaks. And single strand breaks are repaired by a pathway involving a PARP, which recruits the scaffold called XRCC1, um, which facilitates the repair by promoting end processing and also gap filling by polymerase, mainly Paul beta, um, and ligation by ligase 3. And interestingly, defective single strand break repair has been exclusively linked to neurodegenerative uh, diseases. Uh, so that single strand break repair and single strand breaks were, were seem to be a very good candidate. But you know, there's no evidence there are any site-specific single strand breaks um, in, in neurons before. So we developed um, an antibody that recognizes the XRCC1 scaffold that's critical for single-strand break repair. And you can see by the chip assay, there was a pretty good co-localization between XRCC1 and our SARC peaks, indicating that there's actually single-strand breaks that accumulate at these uh, sites. And not only do we see accumulation or co-localization, but again, there's a correlation uh, the stronger SARC peaks had stronger XRCC1 chip and stronger uh, PAR uh, signal. So we're seeing what we think are site-specific single-stranded breaks in the human uh, in these human uh, neurons. But we wanted to go to determine if we can look at this at higher resolution. You know, where are the single-strand breaks actually localized uh, within within uh, the enhancers? And so to do this, we had to develop a, a measure of single strand break. And so we, um, a, a sequencing based method to examine where the single strand breaks were because um, this method, there was not really a method available. So we developed a method called S1NSeq, which took advantage of the S1 nuclease um, that um, can cleave single stranded uh, regions and convert them to double strand breaks. 
which in turn we detected by our NSEQ uh, method. So basically, we take the um, um, neurons and put them in a plug, um, remove protein and RNA, and then use the um, S1 nuclease to convert the single strand breaks into double strand breaks. And if there are double strand breaks, then we detect them by NSEQ. And in this method, what we do is ligate um, hairpin biotinylated adapter to the ends after polishing off the ends. Um, and then we just uh, see, pull down and sequence the ends. And usually, if there's a double strand break, you have a left end and a right end. And this will be reflected in the sequencing reads um, from the bottom and the top uh, strand. And so to test, you know, to develop this method, we generated a DOCS-inducible Cas9 nickase that, would, that we could nick specific sites in the genome, um, and then used our S1 NSEQ to see if we can detect uh, double strand breaks. So we first we arrested um, the cell line in uh, G1 cell, and, and we targeted three different guides um, uh, to a region in, in this, um, in the, in the, in this uh, cell line. Without doxycycline, Cas9 nickase was not expressed. We didn't see anything. But upon doxycycline treatment, you can see that there are three, basically three peaks with left ends and right ends. And so we think that the assay worked um, very well. And then we just applied it to our non-treated, um, you know, uh, these, these uh, in, into our neurons. And we were pretty disappointed, actually, because we didn't see anything. We see our SARSeq peaks, but there's no signal for S1 NSeq. And, and then we were thinking about this, and maybe we thought, well, maybe because we can't catch it, we can't catch these single strand breaks, the repair is just too fast. Um, we can incorporate EDU and detect um, SAR-seq, um, but, but catching single strand breaks before they ligate um, is very, very tricky. So we wanted to slow down the process. And so we used uh, a trick um, um, with chain terminating uh, nucleotides. So these dideoxynucleotides can halt uh, DNA uh, polymerization. Um, once they're incorporated, uh, you can't get any further polymerization. Then you, th then you think that there could be a gap that would form. Then we could treat with S1 nuclease, and perhaps then we could catch this DNA synthesis in action. Um, and, D and indeed, that was the case. When we treated the neurons with these um, chain terminating um, nucleosides, we could see very, very distinct peaks, bottom and top um, strands. And there were clusters of these single strand breaks that you know, remarkably co-localized with these more broader peaks of uh, uh, DNA synthesis. Um, and again, these single strand break peaks um, correlated very strongly with the SARSeq uh, peaks. Of a, so this, so it seems like there's endogenous single strand breaks associated with these enhancers. And so because this is nucleotide resolution, we could then characterize precisely if there was any enrichment of particular nucleotides at these peaks. And what we found is that there was a very strong prevalence of GC nucleotides precisely at these uh, single strand uh, break uh, peaks. And then when we looked back at our SARSeq data and just looked at GC content, uh, we can see that there's a strong enrichment of GC dinucleotides um, at the SARSeq peaks, consistent with our nucleotide resolution um, um, view that these are, are the predominant um, um, kind of signature of these uh, single strand breaks. And I'm gonna come back to this point in a little while, but first I wanted to talk about the actual single strand break repair pathway that's involved because it's pretty unusual. As I mentioned, the simplest way um, to repair the single strand breaks is through this pathway involving PARP, recruitment of the scaffold XRCC1, and then a one nucleotide fill-in and, and ligation by ligase three. So we could use CRISPR interference and inhibitors to knock down, um, to you know, decrease this uh, single strand break repair pathway. 
And what we found very surprisingly is when we use the PARP inhibitor, also when we knock down PARP1, you didn't decrease the SAR-seq uh, signal, you actually increased it. When we decreased XRCC1 expression, you didn't decrease, but you increased the SAR-seq. Same thing with Paul Beta. You knock down this polymerase and you increase SAR-seq. And you can guess what happens with ligase three, the same story. We, 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 we always get an increase um, in, in DNA synthesis. Um, and then speaking to Keith Caldicott, uh, who is also a collaborator on this project, um, you know, he told us that it's, there's not, it's not that simple. There's short patch uh, repair of a single nucleotide, but there's also long patch uh, 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 repair in which um, you have a, there's some trouble just with a single strand, uh, you know, repairing this single nucleotide. And then you have to go to a, a, a pathway involving strand displacement in which maybe 20 or so nucleotides are incorporated. And this is precisely where we think we're getting our EDU uh, incorporated into the DNA. We think that the SAR really reflects a long patch uh, single strand break uh, repair rather than short patch repair. So we think that endogenous single strand breaks and neural en enhancers are frequently processed by this um, strange long patch uh, single strand break repair pathway for some reason. And then finally, we were you know, wondering why is all of the action at enhancers? Why is this enhancer uh, specific? Why, are the, why is this damage targeted to uh, enhancers versus promoters or any, anywhere else? And we had a couple of clues. One of them I just mentioned is that GC dinucleotides are really the prominent um, um, nucleotides at our, uh, our, at our peaks. And one thing that I mentioned earlier is that these regions have to be open. These, the, to going from an inactive enhancer to an active enhancer, you have to open up the region. And one way that this one necessary event is you have to demethylate cytosine residues at these CG dinucleotides. So we're starting to think, okay, maybe this is, we have single strand breaks because of active DNA demethylation. Um, and indeed, during active DNA demethylation, single strand breaks are an obligate intermediate. So this, um, this process is mediated by the TET um, enzymes um, that erase the methylated cytosine to produce a normal cytosine. But it, this goes through various different um, intermediate uh, steps um, in which the methylated base is oxidized to hydroxymethylcytosine formal cytosine and carbo carboxyl cytosine. And these two intermediates, 5-FC and 5-CAC, are recognized by thymidine DNA glycosylase, um, which generates an abasic site, which then is um, attacked by the a AP uh, endonuclease to generate single-stranded breaks. So if this is the process that happens, it would be associated with single strand breaks. As I, as I, as I just mentioned, um, when you have um, 5-FC and 5-CAC, this is recognized as an aberrant base um, and you get AP endonuclease cleavage. And this is where the single strand break um, is generated and it's finally filled in by, um, uh, uh, by, by, D, by DNA polymerases. So the uh, the fourth clue that this might be going on um, is the observation by Nat Heinz um, and others is that this active DNA demethylation mediated by the TET enzymes is very, very active in post-mitotic neurons. They claim that it's 10 times more active than in peripheral cell types. And interestingly, the maximum accumulation of DNA demethylation of these intermediates is at, uh, uh, at enhancers. So this all fits together. So that means that we've got to look at DNA demethylation. And that's exactly what we did. So these are the SAR-seq peaks I mentioned that co-localize almost perfectly with the single-stranded breaks measured by DDN, S1, N-seq. Um, and then we looked at um, um, these intermediates, 5-hydroxymethylcytosine. And you can see that they're broader peaks, but they co-localize very well 
with these single-stranded break peaks. And you can see this on the heat map as well, um, that the SAR seek, the single strand breaks co-localize and are correlated with these intermediates of active uh, DNA demethylation. So we think that active DNA demethylation, it could be, I haven't proved it, but it, it looks like it is the source of the single strand breaks um, that are neuron specific. And what we're detecting um, in the post-mitotic neurons by SARSEQ uh, is this long patch repair pathway that seems to be uh, active for some reason. And once again, when we knock out these components of the short path repair pathway, we see increased SAR and we think that the, we're now shunting the pathway towards this long patch uh, repair. And we speculate that perhaps in neurodegenerative diseases associated with deficiency in single strand break repair, there is an increased reliance on this long patch repair pathway. So that's what we observed. And only speculating that with a longer patch of synthesis, you could get an increased probability of mutation, perhaps. Um, and this mutation or DNA damage at enhancers could have an impact on transcription. And you can get transcriptional deregulation or perhaps, uh, perhaps leading to neurodegenerative neurodegeneration. Um, and you can also imagine that, that this inefficient um, uh, short patch single strand break repair pathway that is specific to neurons could be um, the source of um, lesions um, that accumulate through the lifespan um, leading to uh, mutation. So that's speculation. But I've showed you, I think, you know, probably the first evidence of, si of site and cell type specific single strand break repair which is likely due to programmed uh, DNA demethylation, which is highly active in neurons. And we, indeed, we see a unexpectedly high level of this localized and continuous uh, single strand breaks in the neurons. And we speculate that this could contribute to neurodegeneration associated with single strand break repair and perhaps um, contribute to uh, neurodegeneration and aging. So finally, I just want to acknowledge the, um, <clears throat> the three teams, the green, yellow, and red teams involved in this study. And um, in, in my group, a, this work was spearheaded by a very talented uh, grad, um, graduate student, Will uh, Nathan, um, and a postdoc, uh, Wei Wu. And all of the um, neuron isolation and manipulation was done by Sarah Hill in Michael Ward's uh, group. And we had a very important collaboration with uh, Keith uh, Caldecott's group, um, where we really learned about these uh, DNA, DNA repair uh, pathways. So I just want to uh, end there. And I'm very happy to take uh, any questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. This was really fascinating. So. Um... I'm really excited about your finding because usually I imagine the damage is quite random and you show that it's quite localized. So you mentioned, I'm, I'm curious about this cycle about demethylation and you mentioned one of the glycosylases which is called TDG. Yeah. Is it viable if one knocks is the knockout, are there any, are yeah. there any mice, mice knockouts or what would happen? What? Yeah, I think the mice are, the knockouts are lethal. We try, we tried, to uh, knock down a TDG. And we actually succeeded in the iPSCs uh, cells. But when we differentiated into neurons, um, the knockdown was no longer knocked down. Uh, so we were unable, but we're, we're, we're using a Degron system to try to knock down, um, to remove TDG from the neurons themselves um, and, and to see whether um, that will abrogate this um, um, you know, this detection of uh, DNA synthesis and single strand breaks, but we don't know for sure whether TDG is involved, but that's a, that's a very strong uh, candidate that's necessary for the single strand uh, breaks. Thank you.
and, and if you were to take these neurons in a dish or the right neurons that are of different age, maybe the younger and old, would you expect to have different profiles? Of those? Yeah, so that's a great question uh, because it gets to whether this DNA demethylation is a one-time thing um, and happens um, because you want to differentiate the cells to neurons or is it a continual process? I should mention that the um, uh, DNMT1 uh, is also highly expressed as the same time as the DNA demethylase, as the TET enzymes. So um, it is possible that this is a this is going on uh, in a continually. In a, in a, in a, but we don't. But we don't. We don't, we don't, don't actually, actually know. Actually know. So, so one last question, and then I'll let others because this is so um, interesting. So if it's happening continuously, do you, could it be some kind of oscillation in terms of circadian rhythms? I don't know whether there are any circadian rhythms in this in the differentiated neurons, could it be that it's part of the life cycle? That if you, instead of TDG, if you manipulate circadian rhythms, that you might perturb the... Yeah, that's a great idea. I didn't think about yeah, that. Yeah, that's a great idea. I didn't think about that. Is there an echo? Huh? Okay. I don't um, know. Yeah. No, it's okay. Yeah, I just heard myself. Um, uh, yeah, so we we just don't know if it's a cycle or or not. That's the first thing that we have to determine, and then we and then we would have to figure out if you know what is the what is the uh, mechanism. But it's also you know during the lifespan, there's also stress and changes, and so it's also possible that um, you know it may not be a continuous cycle, but in response to some kind of stress, you can get methylation and demethylation yeah or injury okay, no, in response to, like, or, or in response like to it. injury yes so so yes because i thought maybe those transcripts oscillate from one cut transcription factor i'll let other people ask the question so please could you raise your hand or unmute um does anyone i see a lot of questions in the chat does but i cannot see anyone hands up does anyone would like to unmute and ask a question directly, please? If not, I'll start reading the question. So the first question was from Martin Welch, who says, hi, Andre, fantastic talk and project. Did you try depleting FEN1 to try to limit long patch SSB repair, or perhaps depleting another long patch repair protein? Yeah, um, we didn't succeed in knocking down uh, FEN1, um, so didn't have luck with that, didn't have luck with PCNA, um, haven't been able to really manipulate the long patch pathway, but with a very high dose of aphidocholin, we did see a decrease in the, in the SARC uh, peaks, but so we don't know uh, the polymerases involved, but um, that was the only manipulation that we um that we, so far we've been able to to succeed to decrease this long patch uh re repair um, and of course you know closing up the chromatin also decreased the sarsi peaks as well okay thank you very much uh next question is by paula scafidi who says great talk related to martin's questions carrying fur for both short and long patch repair to push the system and estimate the extent of damage that starts to affect cell function. Example, changes in neuronal markers or functional traits uh, of neurons. Yeah, so that's a great, hi Paula, that's a great question. Um, first in terms of the, uh, the both of the pathways, let me, let me make a point here that in, in, uh, in wild type cells, we see about 50,000 peaks. Uh, when we use PARP inhibitor or knock down Paul beta, we see 150,000 peaks. So we're pushing the, we think what we're doing is pushing the system from short patch to a long patch. Um, and that, and that can kind of give you an estimate of the ratio. If you, if you think that all of the short patch has been converted, you get 150,000 are short patch, um, um, uh, are, are long patch and 150,000 are short patch and, and about 50,000 are, are uh, long patch. And how this affects cell function, we definitely, it's a great question and no idea. Um, and also 
interesting to see whether our hypothesis is true that you also get more mutations when you shunt the pathway towards long patch. We don't have evidence. That's just a that's a hypothesis and depends on how which polymerases might be involved in that. But we don't at this point we don't know. Um, it would be interesting to look at um, neuronal function when you go from one pathway to another pathway. So thanks for that. So are then the age-related mutations in the elderly neuron, are they in your enhancers? So we don't know that yet. We have to do, um, we're, we're setting up an experiment to do um, sequencing, deep sequencing at these sites to see whether they, we, we can, you know, whether the, in, indeed we see mutations in, in single cells. So Lucy Brooks uh, asks, excellent talk, apologies if I missed this, but why do you think this phenomenon is specific to neurons as compared to the other cell types you looked at? Is it just because demethylation is more active yeah. and have you looked at other neuronal cell types? So that's a great, that is a great question. Uh, and I don't have a, a complete answer at all. It's, it's, it's really fascinating. Um, but of course there's active DNA demethylation by TED enzymes, but there's also path passive uh, DNA uh, demethylation during proliferation. So it is possible that somehow, I don't know, I don't think people really know that utilization of the active uh, DNA, uh, the TET pathway, the active pathway is more prominent uh, in neurons than other cell types. But you would think that other cell types would also have at least a fraction. I think I was talking to Angina Rao yesterday who told me that in lymphocytes um, in her system, you get about 10% active demethylation and about 90% passive uh, demethylation. So in lymphocytes, they just don't use TET as much. Is that why it's neuron specific? I, I, I don't know. So next question is by Yaron Galanti who asks, excellent talk, thank you. Uh, so if someone wants to, a mute and raise and, and please, please do Don't go be ahead. Shy. Don't be shy. Yes. So uh, uh, Yaron asked, excellent talk, thank you. Uh, what if there is the link between neurodegeneration, neurodegeneration and AT patients and SSBs? Yeah, uh, that is possible. Uh, we, uh, all I can say is we used, the only thing we did is use an ATM inhibitor. Uh, and we didn't see any change in our SARC peaks. Uh, but it is possible um, that looking at the right cell type, you know, these are, in, you know, looking at the right cell type in AT patient cells, you, it's possible you could, you, there, there could be single strand breaks and maybe they're at enhancers. It's only uh, speculation, but theoretically that could be looked at in some way. Okay. Uh, next question is by Simak Ali. Would you like to ask a question yourself or shall I read it? Okay. Uh, oh, so sure, I can. Hello. I can yeah. Yay. Yay. Um, yeah, super talk. Um, I was wondering, maybe I missed it, but are you able to see um, the role of TDG in this context in changing gene expression. So do you get altered gene expression? Uh, you obviously see all the appropriate marks if these, this is happening at enhancers and so on, but does that lead to changes yeah. in gene expression? The problem, the problem is that, at, um, as I mentioned in the questions, we, ha we haven't been able to uh, manipulate TDG because when we try to do that, um, it just, we couldn't knock it down in neurons. We, we feel like we have to degrade it. Um, um, and, 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 and in the neurons, somehow get rid of it in the neurons. Uh, it, it seems to be playing an important role because it's very difficult to get rid of it. We also you know, thought about um, manipulating the TET enzymes, but there's three TET enzymes, one, two, three. Um, so we're, we're, we're really focused more on TDG, uh, but it doesn't have to be the uh, glycosylase. That's what, we're, that's what we're testing. Once we do, we can examine the impact on transcription, of course. Yeah. but we haven't been able to do it so far. Um, I just wanted to flank up as well, you, you're probably aware of this, but there was a paper from Wilbert Zwart who uh, reported a FEN1 inhibitor. Mm -hmm. That might be interesting. Yeah, we should, we should try that. That's a good Thank idea. You. Thank you.
So next is Susana Godinho. Susana, would you like to unmute and ask your question, please? Uh, hi, I think I guess I guess you already asked this question, right, Ivana? Because I was just wondering oh, if the mutations sorry. found in neurons that are associated with aging are also clustered at these SAR sites. Oh yeah, yeah you know, we we've we've tried to look at that, but you know, um, you know, neurons from the neurons that we're generating are are a little bit artificial. I mean, they're excitatory neurons. Um, they're not necessarily the same neurons as in people, right? They're not exactly the same. So it, um, you really have to, I think you have to look for mutations. You have to probably, we, we want to look at, at in, the, in the same cell type precisely. Um, but there certainly has been a link between um, mutations in neurons and it, that, they're, that they are prominent in enhancers. But whether those are SAR sites, I don't, I don't really actually know. Thank you. Uh, so Lucy, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sorry, it was just on the back of the last one. I was just wondering if you knew whether or not there was any relationship between demethylation as a result of neuronal activity. Um, you know, we don't see a, rela a correlation with, usually these are, you know, we, we don't see a correlation with transcriptional activity necessarily at, at, with the SARC peaks, but we haven't, act, we haven't actually changed neuronal activity, manipulated that and see what happens to our peaks by inducing some kind of um, transcriptional change. So I don't, I don't think that we, um, we actually know that, um, but that's, that's, that's an interesting question for sure. Next question is by Niels Gallo. So Niels, would you like to ask a question yourself? Yes, of course. Um, thank you very much. Um, I don't know whether my question is absolutely irrelevant, but um, I just ask myself whether there are specific genes located at those SR, uh, SAR hotspots. Um, because it would be also interesting to know that regarding um, the question from Ivana, whether they are regulated um, cyclical or oscillating, or if it's one in a life moment regarding this uh, differentiation to a neuron. Yeah, you know, so you, so the SARSIC peaks are usually at, at enhancers, and um, but those enhancers are associated with genes, right? Um, and we've been able to. Um, Link many of our peaks with specific uh, 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 genes that are that are indeed expressed. Um, so, anyways, um, these these enhancers are functional. We do we do know that they're functional enhancers that they regulate, and we know which you know to some extent which genes they regulate. Um, but I'm not sure if I if that was your question. But but it's they're not they're not. Um, Sometimes they're in gene bodies, but they're but they're but they're still enhancers. Yes, I, I just meant um, if these genes regulated by the en enhancers are, for example, specific for neurons, or yeah. are they general? Yeah, they seem to be that are relevant in every every cell. Like no, no, no. So you know, when we looked at enhancers associated with the iPSCs, we don't see SAR seq peaks at those enhancers, as I mentioned. But when we look at neuron, um, in neuronal enhancers, which we mapped, um, that's exactly where we see our SARC peaks. So, so you're right. They're indeed associated with neuron-specific um, uh, enhancers and neuron-specific genes. And that would make okay. sense that you would, get, that you would need demethylation uh, during this transition to activate these genes. OK, thank you very much. Yeah. So I think we have no more questions. I think this was really a fascinating talk and I'm looking forward to uh, finding your enigmas. Why, why does it happen? Um, I think many things in biology oscillate. So I'm very much in favor of this oscillation. That would be great. That would be really interesting if that were the case. And I think, and, I think and we can, yeah. 
like p53 and uh, oscillate I, I i think and another thing about euros is sleep so maybe they pause they they methylate to shut down and they do something to repair during the sleep but that's just my wishful thinking so right. well yeah. thanks very much for your interest and great questions to everyone yeah thank you very much for attending this wonderful seminar and thank you for your time professor nosenzweig bye-bye bye-bye